tender, juicy, mouth-watering, and an amazing source of protein. Love it or hate it, it's time to meet meat. Pound for pound, how do we pick the best cut of meat worthy of what's in our wallets? Does it mean if something is quite expensive that it's a better quality of meat? Not necessarily. With possible hormones and chemicals that scream danger in our meat, could our cravings be killing us? What about savory processed meats? Are they a shortcut to an easy meal or an early death? This week, let's investigate the raw truth about meat and your money. only smell what I smell. This is one of my absolute favorites, beef satay. Now, a single stick can average about 80 cents. They come in bundles of 10, so you could be spending eight to nine dollars for your meal. Now, that's pretty cheap. Think about going out for steak. You could be spending a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. I'm palpitating here. That's a lot of money. So before we go broke thinking about red meat, let's find out what exactly is red meat. The word meat often refers to edible animal muscle, while red meat stands for raw meat that's red and not white when it's cooked. So, what's the difference between red meat and white meat? Red meat always contains a protein called myoglobin, which also contains heme iron, which is highly absorbable by the human body. In contrast, we have an example of white meat, which is chicken, and chicken is white because it contains little or no myoglobin. Meat, especially red meat, is a great source of protein. And protein is essential to the human body. It helps to build muscles, strengthen your bones, repair tissues, and overall just boost your body's immune system. Yeah. Meat contains a whole cacophony of micronutrients, it contains vitamin A, vitamin D, a whole range of B complexes, iron and zinc. A surprising and less known fact is that meat protein has got the essential amino acids that will optimize your height increment. So in other words, to get optimal linear height growth, you need to eat red meat. With all these amazing benefits, it's no wonder we love meat. Now. How well do you meat lovers actually know your meat? We asked a few passers-by if they can match the cuts of meat to the parts of the cow. Where do you think the rib is? I'm not sure. Uh, rib side. Where's the rib side? <laughs> We're going to make a random guess. Yeah, do it. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> this is tough. I know, I know. <laughs> Uh-oh, it looks like nobody has any idea on where the cuts of beef actually belong on the chart. I think it's time to beef up your meat know-how. Did I get at least one right? You got Thank you for that comment. Ah, uh, all right. Rib is correct and round is correct. Everything else, eh, eh. Wrong, you got the chuck right. Awesome. Everything else is not really that right. None? <laughs> all wrong. Oh dear. No butcher will employ me now. <laughs> Thank you for trying. This man has tried and he has failed. And for those of you who want to give it a try, here are the right answers. Different cuts and types of meats also come with very different price tags. So I'm sure some of you have probably wondered why a steak that you can buy relatively cheaply down at the local market will cost you an arm and a leg at a restaurant. Now apart from the obvious markup, my wallet wants to know, why is this so? There's no one better than Chef Dan to tell us why having meat in a restaurant is much more pricey. When you're going to the butcher shop and you're buying a piece of meat, you've only got to pay one person the butcher. But when you go to a restaurant, you're going to pay the butcher, the cook, the waiter. You've got a lot of people involved in getting that piece of meat on your table. So we're going to pay for people's time and people's effort. And other ingredients, I'm guessing, as well. Salt, pepper, electricity, gas. And I suppose you're also trusting the chef's instinct to, to find the right meat in terms of source, origin, all of that. Certainly, what you think about when you go to the supermarket, you've got all those different meats in front of you. And you've got to make a decision. 
what I'm gonna buy. How much do I wanna spend on it? How am I gonna cook it? What am I gonna serve with it? And then I have to go to the rest of the supermarket, pick all the vegetables and all that other stuff. But you've paid somebody at the restaurant to say, this is what I think would be perfect for you tonight. So that's what we're really paying for. Who knew there are so many factors involved in that one piece of meat? And for those of you who want to save money and be your own chef at home, follow me to the butchery where Chef Dan will teach us how to shop like a pro. Well, here we are, k and J Butchery with my good friend James. It's good to see you, James. You all right? I'm looking for a good piece of meat. Yes. Okay, that's not gonna break the bank, so how do we do that? Well, what do you wanna have your piece of meat as? You wanna have it as a steak, you wanna have, you want a steak, okay. So if we're talking steak, we wanna be looking at the bigger cuts of meat down okay. here, all right? Your typical ribeye, tenderloin, sirloin. Does it mean, if something is quite expensive, that it's a better quality of meat? Not necessarily. It might be that it's more hard to come by, like tenderloins. Giant animal, it's only got two little tenderloins on it. So they're much more expensive because of supply and demand. Whoa, there's a lot more to buying meat than I thought. So I asked Chef Dan to get to the meat of the matter. Here are five important tips when you're going to shop for meat. Number one, use your senses. Look at the meat. Does it look good? Has it got a nice red color to it? Is it too dark? Does it have dark spots? Look at the fat, it should be white, lustry and pearly. Always trust your senses. Number two, understand how to speak butcher lingo. You've got all sorts of terminology when dealing with meat. You need to know what is prime, choice, or select. These are levels of meat grading system on the American grading scale. Prime is, of course, the highest, and select would be the lowest. What's Wagyu? What's Angus? Get yourself educated about the meat that you're buying. Number three, the cuts. You don't want to be purchasing tenderloin if you're going to be cooking stew. Tenderloins are for steaks. Stewing meat would be like rib or shoulder or even rump. So you want to make sure you're buying the right cut for the right cooking technique. Number four, purchasing. Don't buy too much. Don't buy too little. You don't want to have hungry guests. Generally speaking, 180 to 220 grams is a pretty healthy portion per person. And number five, maybe the most important one, always trust your butcher. If you've got the opportunity, go to a butcher shop instead of a supermarket. This man wants you to have a good dining experience. It's his job to make sure that you walk out of here with the best purchase that you can have, and he wants you to come back. He needs your business. We serve you the raw truth about meat and your money. Can people really tell the difference between cheap and expensive meat? You taste the difference? They're quite different. And the great meat debate, fresh versus frozen, which is better? Today, it's all about meat and the raw truth about how it hurts or helps your wallet. Earlier, we did a street test to see if people knew where the cuts of beef belonged on the cow. And guess what? They did it. I have no idea. <laughs> this is tough. And we even learned some very useful tips on buying meat from Chef Dan, like choosing the right cut of meat for your meal and looking out for fresh red meat with pearly fats. Now it's back to cashing in on the price tag of meat. Now we know there are many different factors, but does price affect the taste? I know the perfect way to investigate. We've got the meat. We've got the kitchen. We've got the chef. Folks, get ready for the food detectives. Stick out. Our guests are about to arrive, and all they know is that they have meat to munch on. Now, for the first course of this taste test, Chef Dan is preparing an expensive steak and a more affordable steak, both cooked exactly the same way. I want to find out which one tickles their taste buds the best. We're going to be cooking these ones medium, which is well cooked on the outside, browned on the outside, and then with a band of pink in the middle, but not red. We've driven off a lot of the moisture and definitely most of the blood. Excellent. 
an easy way to check for temperature or doneness is this. The bit of flesh between your thumb and your index finger, give it a squeeze. Just like that is what a rare steak feels like. If you touch your index finger to your thumb and squeeze that bit again, it gets a little bit more firm. That's a medium rare. And this hard bit like that is what a well done steak feels like. So anytime you see a chef poking your steak with a finger, he's just trying to check for temperature. The table is laid, the mood is set, all that's left are the guests. Let's hope they're ready to taste some yummy steak. The steaks are almost done. Just a little more to go and voila! Let the taste test begin. So we've got our two different types of beef here. We're gonna identify them as the left and the right. All I need you to do is try both. Just tell me later on which one you prefer and why. Bon appétit. You taste the difference? Yes, I do. They're quite different. This one feels a little leaner. I quite like the left. It's got uh, flavor, aroma, texture. What do you think about the one on the right? How does that taste? It's good, but it's kind of dry. The jury is in. It's time to hear the verdict. I very much preferred the left because I enjoyed the taste and the succulence of it. It was partly because it had much more fat marbling in it. I found the right a little more tougher and, and rougher. I prefer the right. It's kind of rich in flavour. I like the taste. The left one is much more tender and has more fat, fats in it. I prefer the, the left one as a special sort of dining out meal experience. It was juicy and tender. Well, it looks like there's a clear winner. I choose the left one. I prefer the left side. I prefer the left one because the right one is more tough and dry. The results of round one of the taste test are in. Most of my guests preferred the expensive steak over the more affordable steak. What surprised me is that they could tell the difference immediately between the taste. And number two, I'd say, you cannot trick their taste buds. More for me. When it comes to the cost of meat, there are a lot of factors. For instance, where does your meat come from? Now, in Singapore, most of our meat is imported, so it's easy to overlook the details such as how was the meat raised, how was it handled before it landed on our supermarket shelves or at the butchers. Now, I don't know where you're from, but I like you. There are two main factors that affect the price tag on our meat, distance and the way the animals are raised. But if red meat is a must-have on your plate, fret not. There's a way to make even the most expensive meat affordable. The secret lies below 10 degrees Celsius. Feast your eyes on these marbled beauties. Now this is no ordinary meat. No, 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 no. This is frozen. Now frozen meat is relatively cheap, so that means that you can stock them up in your freezer for a very long time. Now, I've been told by the gentleman who runs this place that this meat has been in the freezer for six months and that you can store it in there for up to two years. How is this possible? Is it really safe to eat? There's a common belief that frozen meat is cheaper because it comes from meat that's less fresh than chilled meat. But is this true? If freezing is done efficiently and fast, there's little or no difference in nutritional quality of frozen meat as opposed to fresh meat because the key point is that we don't eat raw meat, we cook it. So therefore, if there's any loss, which is marginal, it'll happen during the cooking process. If you're gonna be stocking up your pantry at home, don't buy fresh meat and freeze it at home. Buy frozen meat and keep it in your freezer. Taking fresh meat and freezing it at home is not recommended. It's not gonna freeze quite as well, it's not gonna lock in the flavor and taste, and it's not gonna be a better product when you defrost it. Frozen meat that you buy at the supermarket has been frozen in a much better manner and at the source. If you're going to be using frozen meat, it's important to plan ahead. Always remember to take the meat out of the freezer the night before you want to use it. Put it in the coldest part of the fridge, probably the meat bin, and let it sit there overnight. Always remember, if you've defrosted your meat, don't put it back in the freezer and refreeze it again. If you haven't used all of it, let it stay in the fridge. It will keep for a good two or three days. Just finish it by then. The next question is, can our taste buds tell the difference between frozen and fresh meat? You'll have to stay tuned to find out. 
Coming up, we investigate this one popular way to enjoy meat. How exactly are burgers made? And are they good or bad for your health? And we dish out the raw truth on processed meat. What hidden dangers do they pose to our body? Minced meat will have bacteria everywhere. So far on the raw truth about meat and your money, we pit cheap and expensive meat against each other. And true enough, people could tell a difference. The left had much more fat marbling in it. The right one is more tough and dry. On top of that, we kicked off the great meat debate. That's fresh versus frozen. Now, we want to see if there's a real difference in taste between the two. For the second course, we're putting frozen versus fresh to the test. Again, none of the guests know what's going on. All they know is that they're eating steak. Now, which one will ultimately win them over? Mwah! Do you think that most people can actually tell the difference when they're eating something, whether or not that meat was frozen or fresh? Well, I'd like to say it all depends on the chef, but <laughs> not always. I think a lot of people in their dining experience, they may know that they don't love this beef more than another beef, but they might not know why. But certainly in my experience, if you're getting meat that seems perfectly cooked, but tastes a little bit dry or even a little bit pasty, then you know you're having frozen meat. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Let's do this. It's round two of the taste test. Cooked frozen meat sits on the left, while fresh meat is on the right. Can they tell the difference? I'm not sort of picking a great difference in the oh. texture. So you're not sensing too much of a difference between the two? I can't, it's not jumping out. I like the right one. I would choose the left one. Left. Hmm, there's a lot of mixed responses here. So let's tally up the votes to determine the winner. For me, the right was much more tastier. It was softer, it was more fragrant, and it was much more appealing. I prefer the right piece. It was tasty and enjoyable. I prefer the left one. I like them both, but I like the right side more. I will choose for the left one. I think they're equally nice, both of them. Same taste, very beefy, very nice. I prefer the right one because um, for my personal taste, I feel it's more juicy and tender. Frozen versus fresh, who won? Fresh. Now, obviously, I have some very discerning guests, but then again, it's not every day you get a chef to prepare something for you, right? So the moral of the story is, if you want a good steak made the right way, sometimes you gotta pay. From enjoying the finer dining options like steak, we move on to a really popular way of chowing down our meat, the good old burger. Now, burgers are a really great way of satisfying your meat cravings without breaking the bank, but how exactly are burgers made, and are they good or bad for your health? The beef burger contains minced meat. It can also contain a binder, like starch or something that will bind the meat together, some salt, some spices and herbs, and may also contain sodium or potassium nitrate. The important distinction between beef cuts and ground or minced beef is that minced beef may contain a variety of cuts that have been put together through the mincer, therefore you may not know where exactly the cuts came from. In addition, there's also a higher fat content in minced meat. And it's not just that, there's more bad news to come. In terms of health issues, newly cut meat will always have bacteria only on the surface, but minced meat will have bacteria everywhere. Because it's all minced and mushed up, the bacteria that's always on the outside gets all surrounded and into the meat. And therefore, when you cook minced meat, you must make sure that it's cooked very well. And the same thing applies to the beef burger. So the beef burger has also been minced, and therefore the bacteria is surrounding every part of the beef burger. So therefore, it's quite important that you never, ever eat beef burger rare. Okay, it's all gonna be properly cooked burgers for me from now on. And so it's time to look at a type of meat that's invading our homes, lunchboxes, restaurants, and just about everywhere and anywhere. 
Processed meats are definitely very convenient. They're easy to cook, they're budget friendly, they last a long time, and they taste pretty good. So, what's that to like? Many people are concerned about the presence of nitrates and nitrites in meat products, especially processed meat. But nitrates and nitrites play a very important role in processed meat because one, it retains the color of the meat being red, and secondly and significantly, it reduces the risk of this very dangerous bacteria called Clostridia botulinum toxin. The use and application of nitrates and nitrites are controlled very rigorously by AVA and many organizations around the world. The key point to remember when you buy processed meat is to look at the label, and secondly, to buy your processed meat from reliable suppliers. Sadly, for meat lovers, there may be a heavier price to pay, and this could mean our health. It's not surprising to hear that some types of meat have been linked to some serious health issues. In fact, the health industry is cautioning consumers against the overconsumption of red meat because of too much fat and cholesterol. Global studies have shown that excessive intake of red meat does increase your risk of getting bowel cancer. But we need to keep it in proportion. Significantly, to reduce the risk of acquiring bowel cancer, you may want to increase the amount of fiber that you consume in the fruits and vegetables that you consume in concert with red meat. The key point is everything in moderation. There's no need to stop our love for processed meats completely, or just meats in general, but here are a few tips to enjoy your meat without adding on to your health risks and money problems. Try one no meat day per week, or even maybe having one meaty meal per day. You'll consume less fat and it's cost effective too. Choose less fatty parts of meat to buy and cook. Don't be shy about asking your butcher to give you leaner choices. Make sure you always have a balanced diet on your plate. Lastly, portion control. When your tummy says stop, stop, even if the food still looks appetizing. We've uncovered so much raw truth about meat and your money. Now, if you don't want to slice your budget, talk to your meat seller. Find out where your meat comes from and how you can get the best price for your cut. Now, with red meat, try to eat that in moderation because there is some fat and cholesterol in there. And also try to choose fresh or frozen meat instead of processed meat. And if you're open to other types of animal protein, there's always chicken or even goat. Now, here's hoping you meet your match. <laughs>